your two new sisters in Jesus, by the way. Um, make sure I do one of, of the great things that we do here. And I'm really, uh, we just are so excited to, to see them and to see these new Christians. And I know that, that just like Peter on that lake that we read about this morning, you, you see the potential and you see the, the good and the great that will come from these people and uh, that will come from you through these people. And please, Lord, use each of us uh, as as your tools and, and lights to shine. Uh, thank you for these. Thank you for Brooke and uh, for Terry. And thank you so much for the way that you have uh, and, and people that went into directing and leading and teaching and, and brought them uh, here today. And any time that we can be used by you to, to teach and lead, please, please let us be used. We'll, we'll see where we go and what happens. We also have no control here. Uh, I want you to imagine a courtroom scene. For some of you, it would be easier than others, right? I want you to imagine. And, and seated on that courtroom benches are, are leaders. They're government officials. Maybe they're, they're presidents. Maybe in some countries, they're, they're kings. They're senators, they are congressmen, they are uh, in the church, they are elders, ministers, deacons. Maybe depending on how you read this psalm, you might even imagine there are spiritual, there's no need for a jury, whatever he decides is final. There, There are no lawyers present, he doesn't need anybody to explain to him exactly what's going on. He already knows exactly what is going on and he is getting ready to mouth and offer a verdict against them to accuse them of a crime. Now you might wonder, what in the world <clears throat> would cause that to happen to the Holy Spirit? They've Maybe they're worshiping on the wrong day, or they don't uh, celebrate the right feast days. A Psalm of Asaph hides in the great assembly. He gives judgment among the gods. How long will you defend the unjustity to the wicked? Defend the cause of the weak, the fatherless. Maintain the rights of the poor and the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They know nothing. They understand nothing. They worry, right? There's all kind of government leaders, but... <clears throat> Paul writes in Romans chapter 13, everyone must submit himself to governing authorities. For there is no authority except that which God has established the by God. Do you realize that, that civil rulers in our world are acting as God's rep, even if they don't know it, even if they don't understand it, then God has put those into place. And he comes across with this message, and here's the sinner. The center of the psalm is deliver the powerless from the hand of the oppressors. Don't allow people to be oppressed. Don't show partiality to those who are rich. Don't show partiality to the wicked. Don't show partiality to anyone, but make sure that you rescue the powerless from the hand of the oppressors. Then when he writes this, he says, defend the cause of the weak and fatherless, maintain the rights of the poor and the oppressed, Rescue the weak and needy, deliver them from the hand of the wicked. So if you have one of those little sheets and you're trying to fill it out, and it says, hey, what are the five groups? Anybody got a sheet? But what does he mean by these words? Who is? But there are people in there. His word is, yes. is it still our response? Yes. Did we pass it to somebody else? No, it's ours. It is our responsibility to make sure that those people are cared for in our community. So 1 Timothy chapter 5 gives instructions about that. Think about orphans. Those who are fatherless, without parents, don't have the resources to provide for themselves. And you've got to realize in some ways our world looks different from a one to care for them. Like this. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this. To visit orphans and widows in their, in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. To take care of those in our world who are powerless. Who cannot help themselves. I think about Asaph in that parable and that, that psalm that he wrote, and I think about Jesus when he is 
He comes by the pool and there is a man who has been there for years, not able to get into the water. Think about lepers and deaf, mute, invalid. So he sees him lying there and he knew he's been there a long time. I mean, don't you really love the, the thing that Jesus asked? He says, do you want to be healed? I mean, how do you think he's going to answer that question? And how did the sick man answer? I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred and while I'm going down the st- another steps down before me to put me in the pool and Jesus heals him. Or you think about Old Testament verses, right? When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge. Nor shall you gather the gleanings after you, your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. So God made provision for those who were poor that had no property, had no way to sustain their life, had no way to find food. And so God, inside the law that he gave to Israel, said, don't, don't harvest all the way to the edge. I mean, I don't know how you would think about that in, in your world, in your terms. When you pick the tomatoes, don't get every one. Leave a few, right? Leave a few on the vine for somebody who might come along and need something later. There's this passage in Isaiah where God says something remarkably similar. It says the Lord takes his place in court. He rises to judge the people. And the Lord enters into judgment against the elders and leaders of his people. And you think, it is you who have ruined my vineyard. The plunder from the poor is in your houses. What do you mean by crushing my people? Logically wrong, it is you are oppressing the poor and the helpless, and you are stealing the wages. Balance that, but it's not really a balance, but we have to be careful too because we're, we're not to show partiality either, are we? There's no favoritism. You think about that court, and there is a, and there is a rich man and a poor man that comes in, no partiality to the one that's poor. But, I mean, God is so very specific. He says, don't pervert justice. Don't show par- partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great but judge your neighbor fairly. Don't follow the crowd. I mean, boy, our world needs this, doesn't it? Don't follow the crowd in doing wrong. When you give testimony in a lawsuit, do not pervert justice by siding with the crowd. Do not show favoritism to a poor man in his lawsuit. I know these are all law cases and courts of law, but get down to the church, doesn't he? Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes. And a poor man also comes in in shabby clothes. If you're rich in faith and inherit the way he's dressed, you do that based on their skin color. No. Should we do it based on their economic status? No. We don't show... Defend for the cause of the fatherless. Maintain the rights of the poor and the oppressed. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. Now I know in some... And there wasn't uh, an, an orphanage. Can it cause a huge need in a family? Yeah, I mean, all these are yes questions, right? It's our responsibility to help in those situations. So you ask, well, what can we do? Well, one thing you can do is you can pray for the discernment of your leaders, right? You can pray for, for your elders in, in this church. There, there are eight of us, right? I'm not going to name you out and make you stand up. You know who there are? There are eight of us. Do we need your prayers in trying to figure out how do we reach out? How do we rescue the poor and the needy and the oppressed? Yes. Do we need to be sensitive to their needs? Absolutely. I sat with this this gentleman this week, and we we had lunch together, and uh, someone I've met recently is going to end up being a pretty good friend of mine, I think. And uh, we were talking about different things. He was asking me what I was preaching on Sunday, and I was explaining my sermon to him, and he said, yeah, because sometimes helping isn't helping. And I was like, yeah. Yeah, I like the way that you said that. I've said it a bunch of ways through the years, but I like that. Sometimes helping isn't helping, is it? And for the discernment to know when to help and how to help and how to reach out to someone and how to do it in the right way, those are just so important, and we try to figure out how to do those types of things. Remember the needs of our widows. I'm not going to put you on the spot. Okay, I started to put myself on the spot, but I'm not going to. They're not going to put you, but I'm not going to put you on the spot either, so nobody has to answer. All right? Nobody stand up and give me a list. You couldn't get out a piece of paper and start writing it. But if I ask you, who are the widows that could you write them on a piece of paper? 
Do you know who they are? Some of you are nodding yes, and some of you are looking, I hope this isn't a test because I'm going to fail, right? <laughs> stop, even if it's your preacher, what I have to stop and think for a little bit before. Again, if they're older. A thought insurance has created such a, an call. Maybe it's a prayer. I told him in Sunday school class, I went to see John Pugh. Uh, some of you know John. I went to see John, uh, uh, and he's been laid up in the hospital for I realized, you know, sometimes it, I had a friend who had heart. I, I can imagine. I haven't done the, the second one yet, Leslie, but I can imagine. He said, that's a whole different perspective. He said, and it's going to make me a better minister because of what I had to suffer. Sometimes we just don't open our eyes to how we can really respond to somebody with a medical need. You know something I miss? I miss Servant Sundays. I miss Servant Sundays. Told the others I was going to preach about this this morning. Now, I need to be very clear. The thing I miss about Servant Sundays is not eating. Although I like to eat. I mean, everybody who knows me knows that I like to eat. Because on a normal work day, by 9 o'clock, I'm trying to figure out where I'm going to go eat lunch at 11. Okay, so 9 o'clock, I'm putting my lunch plans together. So if you ever want to eat lunch with me, you better start making plans at 9 o'clock because I'm planning at 9 before I'm going to be at 10 or 11. You can eat lunch as early as 10, you know, depending on what time you ate breakfast. So I love to eat, but that's not why I miss Servant Sunday. I miss the fellowship part of the eating. Well, what I really miss about Servant Sunday is when we used to divide up into groups and go out into the community and we would, we would build a ramp. Or y'all would build a ramp, I'd go get milkshakes. Or we would, I remember the house that needed to be pressure washed and restained. You know, and going out and serving in the community. Not, not because we had to, not to get any money, just because we, we had people who were out in the community and they would recognize the need and then say, you know what, Clarksville Highway will take care of that. And you know what, I missed that. I miss knowing that if somebody sees a need in this community, if they see something that needs to be done or they see a tree down or a ramp that needs to be built or <clears throat> a light bulb that needs to be changed, I don't care what it is, it, and they would be, have the confidence to say, you know what, Clark's for Highway will take care of that. And that's what I miss about Servant Sunday. What I miss about the Servant Sunday thing is the first word, the servant part. And I'll be the first one to tell you, I'm, I'm looking forward to the day we can go back to having servant Sunday. I don't care if we eat or not, but we need to get back to serving. People in our world are powerless to change their situation. You know what I think about when I read that statement? I just think about children. They didn't get to pick which family they were born into. They didn't get to pick how their parents were going to treat them. They didn't get to treat what their life was. They didn't get to pick what their life was going to look like. And I think about children who are in situations that are just, just not good. And they have no ability to change their own situation. They're, they're powerless. I think about someone who's trapped in a job and can't leave that job to find another job because they've got to have that check to pay this check and they can't move from one job to another job because they're just kind of powerless to change their situation. It's not that they don't want to, it's just they're caught in a situation where they're powerless to do anything. Or I think about a family where medical bill after medical bill after medical bill is being laid in a mailbox. And, and they're looking at that amount of, of money just saying there's no way I can ever, that I can ever pay that. And it's not that they didn't plan. It's not that they weren't ready. It's just that sometimes life just happens in a really strange kind of way. But they're powerless. You know, I, I don't know all the things we can do to our uh, community, but I'm going to ask you to do one thing. Now, now August the 1st, we're going to have a back-to-school bash. And... Uh, I don't know everything about what that looks like because I'm not planning it. Uh, but uh, I, I know we're going to have all the stuff you see on there, like a water slide and inflatables. And, and, uh, and, and, and uh, the one that really kind of gets me is, uh, and th this one's going to be real interesting. Can y'all read this little part right here? Complimentary haircuts. Whew. 
I'm thinking, I don't know if I'm going to line up for that one or not. If Charlie Moffat's cutting hair, I'm skipping that one. No, we have professional people who are doing that, okay? So don't, no, they're going to be good haircuts. They're not going to be Charlie Moffat haircuts. All right, good complimentary haircuts. <clears throat> I want you to look at this part right there. What is that? Can you read what that says? Free school supplies. And you say, Greg, why do you have free school supplies up there? You know why? Because our county needs some. Their kids are going to show up for class that aren't going to have what they need to do well in that, in that class. It's not going to happen. Now, I, I can't go into all the reasons why it won't happen. I can just tell you it's not going to happen. And I want us to respond to that. I, I want us to know that when we have this back-to-school bash, if there's a kid there that, that needs something, that, that, that we can provide that. Now, there's some things that are pretty generic, to, pretty specific to every list, okay? A 24-pack of Crayola crayons. This, this is in the bulletin, right? Okay, Jackie, give me a head. It's in the bulletin. If, uh, if you don't get a bulletin, you see me, I email it to you. A 24-pack of Crayola crayons. That, that's something, most of these are designed to, to East Cheatham School, by the way, but I'm sure Pleasant View Elementary and a lot of other elementary, I'm sure it did apply to Dinah. Will this apply to Robertson County as well? Okay, head shakes, yeah. And you don't, glue sticks. It said it really didn't matter what kind of brand, just glue sticks. So glue sticks, a three-ring pencil pouch. Now I got to tell you, I don't even know what that is. I guess it's a pencil pouch you put a, a pouch you put pencils in. But did we ever have those in school? Uh, Hornbeak never had a three-ring pencil pouch. That's probably it, probably a new invention since I was in <laughs> elementary school. All right, would you bring me some? All right. Do what? We had, oh, we did. We had a cigar box. We sure did. Okay. So that's like the modern cigar box. There we go. That's exciting. I don't know what it's for now. You put all your stuff in there. All right. <clears throat> Composition notebooks, uh, Clorox wipes, Kleenex, hand sanitizer. Do you think it's possible, just a small thing to reach out to needs? that you could bring some of that before August 1st. Now, if you don't have time to go shopping, if you say, Greg, I'd really like to bring some of that stuff, I just don't have time to go shopping. And you got a big, thick checkbook, you just write a check and put it in my hand and I'll make sure somebody else goes shopping. <laughs> right? Right? Don't let the lack of time keep you from helping if you've got the money. All right? Do you have to buy everything on that list? Am I asking each one of you to buy everything on that list? No. If you buy one thing on that list, I'll be happy. It's a small way to reach needs, but it's a need in our community. Did you catch the last verse of that psalm? Rise up, O God, and judge the earth, for all the nations are your inheritance. So those who have not judged well, those who have not accepted the responsibility that God has placed on them in our world, those who have oppressed the poor, that's taken advantage of widows, has taken food out of the mouth, mouths of orphans, those who instead of lifting up the needy and the oppressed have taken their foot and stamped them down in the dirt, Who will rise up and judge the earth? Our God will rise up and judge the earth. Our God, who understands justice and mercy, He understands rescuing the poor and the helpless. And I know that because He rescued you. And he rescued me. And he will rescue hundreds and thousands of those who come after us because we have tried to be faithful representatives of his on this earth. Aren't you glad that at the last day when the God who looks at you to judge you is the God who sees, he just sees the purity of your heart. He sees all of your sin wiped away by the blood of Jesus. 
He looks at you 